Hello, everybody. Um, I'm hoping I am now broadcasting. Um, good, yes, good evening, everybody. I'm Catherine Croft. I am the director of 20th Century Society and I'm really pleased to welcome you all for an evening of very um, special tour of Japan. Um, we went to Japan um, a couple of years ago. I was very sorry not to be able to go myself um, and as a result I'm particularly looking forward to seeing the photos tonight. Um, we have with us um, uh, John East, our photographer extraordinaire, uh, who has taken many, many pictures uh, on trips for, uh, for the 20th century over the years um, and uh, takes his tripod with him absolutely everywhere. We, we also have Neil Jackson, Professor Neil Dax Jackson from um, the University of Liverpool School of Architecture, who, as you will have seen, has both written his own book on Japan and contributed the chapter on 20th century Japan in the fantastic new Bannister Fletcher Guide to Architecture, which is a massive encyclopedia of everything you could possibly want to know. Um, and if you haven't come across it yet, I do recommend checking it out. So, um, so we, have, we have an excellent combination. And uh, what Neil is going to introduce the um, the outline of where we went and then hand over to John who will display his slides and I think Neil you're going to do a commentary to John's slides this week rather than rather than John talk us through them but we'll see how it goes I think this can be quite flexible and um, I wanted to say to everybody that if you want to ask a specific question can you use the Q&A button if you want to chat and make comments um, you know, that don't really require an answer, use the chat button. And uh, do remember that 20th Century Society, we organise the foreign trips partly to have fun and to, to see fabulous architecture, but also as a way of raising funds for doing our casework to campaign to save the best buildings of the 20th century back here in the UK. So um, it seems appropriate to mention to you now that although this event is free, if you felt that you could give us a donation towards our casework, it would be very much appreciated. And as last week, if you give us £10 or more, I will send you a pack of four greetings cards made from some of John's fabulous pictures. And I just wanted to say as well, before we start, that if you had signed up, we originally wanted to do this event as a real physical thing in our headquarters in Farringdon in London. And if you'd signed up for a ticket to that, we're going to email you and ask you which set of um, greetings cards you would like. So um, we, we have, we, we're have we working on finessing our systems um, and we'll be in touch with you. So um, I think without more ado, I'm going to hand over, first of all, to, to Neil. Right. Welcome and hello and uh, konnichiwa, as they would say in Japan. What I'm going to do in the first few minutes here is give you a brief um, run through of where we went and then John's going to follow on with a series of slides, quite a lot of them I understand, which will follow the same route. So um, in a sense you're going to do two tours of Japan, but um, there's no harm in that. If you had trouble reading the English, here it is in Japanese. And our tour concentrated on this part of Honshu, the, the main island um, which makes up the Japanese archipelago. We flew into Tokyo and arrived, um, I don't really know what time, but it, it wasn't, um, oh dear, I'm not moving forward here. Clearly it wasn't um, the middle of the afternoon. There's the tour leader looking absolutely exhausted and we haven't even started. And we were being met here by um, Aiko Ito, who was a, a wonderful leader for the group. And she looked after us while we were in Tokyo. 
The tour was organized in terms of the logistics by Cox and Kings, who you can see are being advertised here um, very clearly. And we were taken with a brief excursion, which I'll talk about in a second, to our hotel, the Prince Hotel at Shinagawa, where um, you might say most of us were welcomed, the century people were not. Okay, so this is where we stopped first of all. You might think it's in New York, but it isn't. This is Tokyo. And I think it's quite a good introduction to Japan, which essentially says, no, not everything is quite as you expect it to be, um, which is a lesson I've learned through, I don't know, many 10 visits to Japan. And every time I think go there, I think I've figured something out. and It turns out I haven't. We arrived in the middle of a typhoon. It was pouring with rain. So the first building we wanted to see was this one and John will tell you all about it. We, um, we did have a look, we piled back on the bus, went into the center of uh, Tokyo, and you can see somebody here, bottom left of this picture, managing to snap a photograph before the, the clouds opened up again. I imagine it's a, a waterproof telephone he's using, or she's using. But the next day the sun came out and the weather was absolutely brilliant. And we went to Ueno Park, and um, saw interesting things like, like this very large reflective sphere. And I can't now remember what was on the other side of it, but Carolyn's certainly looking through some aperture there. And on the bottom left, there's some of us sitting, um, having gone round Le Corbusier's Museum of Western Art, um, having a bit of a rest. It was really quite hot. Japan is full of interesting things, not least street furniture, as you can see here, somewhat coy and cute. I don't see if it would, um, I don't think it would necessarily work in London, but we might try it. We had our introduction to Buddhist temples here. Um, Aiko uh, showed us how to purify, how to wash our hands before going into a temple where um, the priests have mobile phones like everybody else does. You can see them sitting there in line, uh, texting away. We looked at lots of buildings over the next couple of days. Some of it was quite exhausting. Robert had to lie down here, but actually he was taking a photograph of the ceiling in Frank Lloyd Wright's school building. And uh, the curious design on the right are all the pigeonholes or letter boxes in the, um, the capsule tower, which we'll also be visiting later in this show, one of the highlights of the whole tour. We traveled around on the um, subway train, very clean, very fast, very efficient. And after three days or so in Tokyo, we went to Nagoya and we went by Shinkansen. This is, um, I think, very typical of, of Japanese high speed rail. This is something you won't see at King's Cross or St Pancras. Maybe you will see it when HS2 comes in, but that will be a long time off. We got a glimpse of Mount Fuji, the, the one place everybody seems to want to see in Japan, as we whizzed past in rather murky weather. And it was through the window, of course, and behind somebody's head. But at least there it was. And we arrived in Nagoya and the next day went down to an extraordinary architectural museum called Meiji Mura. Meiji means the Meiji era, the Emperor Meiji. 1868 to 1912. Mura means village and it's a collection of about a hundred or well, no less than 180 buildings that have been brought from other places. And we had tea there in Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel or what was left of it at least and John was busy as always taking photographs and you can see he's got a good camera and a tripod and you're in for a great show of pictures. From there we um, got on a bus and we went first of all, coach I should say, to Ichinomiya and there we are being advertised somewhat more correctly. This time our tour of Japan took us to Ichinomiya, took us to Hashima, Gifu, all brief stops to look at interesting and different buildings such as this one here. Um, I don't know if I'd want to be on the top floor when the, when the elevators cease to work, it's a long way up. And then eventually we ended up in Kyoto. Traveling through Japan is altogether um, a learning experience. It's very regional, the food is different in 
um, different parts of the country and so it seems are the um, toilet facilities. On the left the high-tech toilet with lots of knobs and buttons all in Japanese. If you don't understand it my advice is don't try to work it. On the right something a little bit more straightforward with natural ventilation at low level. Then on to Nishinomiya where we went to a building that had been a hotel and it is now a school of architecture. I can't think of a better place. And what's intriguing about that is that it is a school of architecture only for women, women students. There are male teachers, but anyway, only girls learn architecture there. And these two young women are showing us um, pictures of the hotel explaining the building. And you can see they're doing it in what must be the student shop because there are bottles of glue and drawing instruments for sale in the glass cabinet. And on the building, I saw a lovely beetle. If anyone knows about beetles, they might know what this is. I just thought it was rather colourful. From there, we went to Uji and thence to Nara, the ancient capital of Japan, where there is the largest single um, timber building in the world. And we'll see more pictures of this later. We now have a new guide, Hiroyuki Makawa, and you can see him there um, with a bag over his arm and a, a flag calling us all to order. And then the furthest west we went to, was to Hiroshima, where of course the, the first um, atomic bomb was dropped. And this photograph of a heron on the remains of a building is actually almost exactly on the, um, the epicenter of the blast. This is the atomic dome as they now call it. And just down the road from there is a building which survived the blast. This is the branch of the Bank of Japan and the building had just opened in the morning when the bomb went off. Everybody inside was killed but because of its, its solid structure somehow it, it survived. Here's something I just happened to notice. I suppose coming from the University of Liverpool, it had a certain um, resonance. I can't quite understand why the Beatles should be celebrated in the hobby base, but, but there you go. And from Hiroshima, we took the train all the way back in one, one run to Tokyo. And on the final day, um, after enjoying yet more wonderful Japanese cuisine, which you can see here, and indeed Japanese ice cream. If you don't know about green tea ice cream, matcha ice cream, I can certainly recommend it to you. In fact, there's all, all sorts of green tea varieties. Green tea spaghetti is quite good too. And then on the final day, we went down to Yokohama and to uh, Kamakura, which is a really rather charming small town right at the end of that peninsula where we eventually said goodbye to um, Aiko who had joined us again for the latter part of the trip. She's holding up a sign as she did so often with instructions at the end of Shopping Street 4.25 p.m. So we were under firm instructions we had to be there but actually it was rather good because when we did get there guess what there was more um, Japanese matcha ice cream. So there we are, that's the, that's the tour. We're now going to see some pictures. John will try to um, uh, go slow enough for me to say something. <clears throat> we'll see how it goes. But we had a, a wonderful time and there's the title again in Japanese and there it is if you're still struggling with your Japanese characters, there it is in English. And I think John, it's over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, John, you're just setting up now, aren't you? Yes, I am. Excellent. Ready to go. Good. So it's back over to you, Neil, and um, the uh, Fuji TV headquarters. Yes. Um, well, this is the building we went to see in, and it's, it's really quite hard to um, enjoy a building such as this. Quite complicated large, very big structure. This was one of the, the last buildings that uh, Tangi was involved with. 
and it's out in open land sort of beside the harbour area of, of Tokyo, Tokyo Bay. And well, if you think this is uh, strange, I think it indicates to some extent, at least in my opinion, that Tangi's practice was getting a little bit um, over the top and the, the finer work of his early years seemed to have been forgotten. Shall we go on, John? Yes. Okay. Go on. Now, why did we go here? Because this is actually rather significant. This is a house built for the first president of the Mitsubishi organization. And you know Mitsubishi make all sorts of things now. It was built by Josiah Kondo, who was a British architect who went out to Japan at the age of 24 to be the first professor of architecture at the University of Tokyo, or what became the University of Tokyo. And it was up to him to establish architectural education in Japan. And this is very much an example of what he built when he was there. But it has a curious American look to it, not least because um, Iwasaki, the, um, the man who commissioned it, had been to the University of Pennsylvania and studied there. So I think we, he had some idea in the sense of what he wanted. And round the back, um, one might not expect this, but this is an example of Weyo Kongo Jutaku, the combination of Japanese and Western architecture together. The idea really that the Western house was for show. It was for either the businessmen to meet Western clients, Western contacts, meet them in a building that showed how wonderfully Westernized he was, while his family lived in this actually much, much larger building pushed out behind at the back. And this is very much a traditional Meiji era house in Japan. Oh, you've got me here. We went on to the uh, hillside terrace complex. Oh, is this part of the hillside yes. terrace complex? Oh, I didn't recognize this one. Sorry, it's uh, Fumihiko Maki. The Hillside Terrace Complex is a development that has continu that continued for about 25 years, from 1969 to 1992, by Maki. And it's, it's a very, um, in a sense, very typical of Japanese development, small bits being added on and added on again. Um, Maki was, of course, one of the metabolist group, and the idea of metabolism in architecture was the thing that can would suggest. So in 25 years, this development of shops and departments, um, exhibition spaces, restaurants, grew along the, um, the side of the hill where it's located in a, in a coherent yet varied manner. And right down the very far end is the, um, the embassy building for the for the Royal Dutch um, Embassy. And I think you can see in this the great variety really of form and material, yet uh, there's nevertheless a sense of coherence that runs all the way through the building, buildings, I should say. This is the, um, the strange building by Nigel Coates and Doug Branson, one of a number of restaurant buildings which Branson Coates built during the, the Japanese bubble boom of the um, early 1990s. <clears throat> the, it came in two parts. The bit on the right is called The Wall, and this was really the restaurant facility. And it's got work by um, Grayson Perry, who did ceramics for it, Tom Dixon and Jessica Thomas, who did the bronze figures that you can see on that, um, that steel structure out front. The idea of the wall is that it was an ancient, ancient building built originally by the Romans, which in, indicates that the Roman Empire had in fact stretched as far as Japan. Well, if you can believe that, you can possibly believe anything. And the tower on the left uh, was the arts tower. Anyway, that was the wet weather day. And, sorry, John. Well, let's go on to the warm weather day and this building here. We're now in Ueno Park, which is the museum park in the north center of Tokyo. And it, it's crammed full of large and really rather wonderful museum buildings. This is the, um, the 
Hayokaikan, which was the wedding gift, really, for um, the new crown prince, built in 1909 by Tokumo Katayama, who was one of the architects that Josiah Konda trained. It was, he was in the first graduating class, which only had four students in it, so it was quite intense education. And the, the reason that the museum buildings are here is this was actually the site of a big international exhibition that uh, Japan organized back in the 1870s. And the first large museum building had been built on this site by uh, Josiah Condor. That had fallen down in the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake. So in the 1930s, there was a competition to build the new Imperial Museum. And this was won by um, Hitoshi Watanabe. And the competition rules said that the building had to somehow be Eastern and reflect Japanese culture. So what we get is a building that is ostensibly Japanese on the outside. It is called the Imperial Style or in Japanese Taikan Yoshiki. And it's actually um, a bit of a lie because the whole arrangement is incredibly beaux art. It's very symmetrical. It has a port cochere on the front, it has side wings that extend and so on, and all the structure is reinforced concrete. So apart from a few uh, glazed roof tiles and frilly bits around the edge, um, it's really quite hard to say that anything is particularly Japanese about it. But this was really the basis of a big row that developed in the architecture community in Japan. Uh, Kunio Makawa had put in a competition entry which the architects judged were the best but this was the winning entry the one that you see here and this of course was very retrogressive and it, it represented really the swing to the right that was going through Japanese politics and very much enforced by the Japanese military in the early 1930s with as you will know um, severe results in the 1940s. Well on this site um, after the war, there was a, um, an idea for building a museum of Western art. This is really because there was a large collection of art in, in, in Paris, which would belong to a Japanese person and was requisitioned. And the only way that it could go, go back to Japan uh, was that if it was put there, in a sense, as an as a exhibition building, otherwise it would have all been um, you know, held in Europe. So Le Corbusier was invited to build this building, the National Museum of Western Art. And he came out in November 1955 and he stayed just one week to have a look at the site. When he arrived, he said, since my youth, I have been particularly attracted by the scenery and architecture of Japan. Now I am hoping to gain something besides design work. At present, the page is completely blank. Remember that at present the page is completely blank for the museum design concept will emerge by first assembling the ambience, assimilating the ambience of the site and request from the Japanese side and only then adding my own ideas. Oh, fine and proud words, brave words. But as you'll see in a moment, um, the building was somewhat the same as this one we see in Chandigarh. And that's the Chandigarh version, and then there's the uh, Medabad version, which you see here. So um, all these buildings are actually the same party, the same idea. He had nothing fresh to offer. It's a rectangular or square plan with a spiral form inside. And that's, that's what makes these buildings. We're back now in Tokyo in the center hall space, and you move around the building on ramps such as this which take you up to galleries on the upper levels, as you see here. Across the, um, across the way, across the road, there is the Tokyo Metropolitan Festival Hall of 1957. This is by Kunio Makawa, um, who I mentioned earlier, the person who was unsuccessful in the um, competition for the the Imperial Museum building. Makawa was the first Japanese architect to work for Le Corbusier in Paris. So there was a very close bond here. They got on extremely well. And when Corbusier came to do the building in the, um, 
in Ueno Park, the National Museum of Western Art. Maikawa and the two other Japanese architects who had worked in his office in Paris became um, on-site architects to see the project through. Le Corbusier never uh, saw the building under construction, never saw the completed building. This is very Corbusian on the outside, but I always think the inside, those heavy battered walls, um, take an awful lot really from Japanese um, castles, uh, such as the old Nikko Castle in Kyoto. Now we're still in the Ueno Park. This is uh, Yoshiro uh, Taniguchi's Gallery of Eastern Antiquities, which is um, the first of two buildings by uh, the Taniguchi's father and son. This building you might think is, is very much a modern building, but I see it really as a very Japanese building with these heavy, heavy concrete columns, which could be interpreted as being timber. It has very much the idea of a timber temple about it, the overhanging roofs and so on. And the walls, which are set back and seem to be panelled, seem possibly to be lightweight, could almost be shoji screens, but of course they're not. This is the one done uh, 30 years later. The first was 1966, this is 1996. Uh, Yoshio Taniguchi, and now with his son, the gallery of um, Horiuji treasures. And this shows a big change in 30 years in Japanese architecture from those large concrete buildings, very powerful buildings of the um, Tangi era to these really quite delicate steel and glass buildings which nevertheless um, still reflect uh, traditional Japanese architecture. So um, the next day we spent uh, looking at uh, Ginza Maranucci and Nihu Hambashi. Um, uh, and we start off here, which is, we walked or we set a, 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 a light to walk through the Hamu, Hama Rikyu Imperial Gardens, um, which are really are well fabulous. And this is images looking across the central office uh, district. In fact, that building on the right, the Crescent Building, was designed by Jean Nouvel in um, 2002. And to give you some sense of scale, it's actually 213 metres high. So pretty much taller than most of the buildings in the city of London, actually. Certainly, I think, from the right, would be taller than that West Tower. So that gives you some feel for the scale of what we were um, looking at. But the reason through, uh, for, for walking through the park was to um, get to Ginza and the commercial and sort of retail district of Ginza with these ex a whole series of these very tall, narrow, uh, sort of uh, retail and commercial buildings. And this one here is uh, Ricardo uh, Bofill's uh, Shiseido. Uh, building from 2001 in the sort of you know post postmodern sort of idiom. We then have uh, a little bit later, four years later, um, the Mikimoto uh, building by uh, Toyo Ito or Ito, uh, and you see a succession of buildings of a very sort of similar form, very tall and uh, very narrow. Particularly this one, the Damiani building. I don't know who the architect is. Um, but these wonderful facades, and um, of course, they're not at all uniform. Um, but the great thing is, in some crazy sort of way, you know, it really works. Um, you get that sense of scale. And, and I suppose the reason it works is because you just get a series of really bizarre but fabulous uh, buildings. Um, this, in fact, I do know the architects of. This is um, the Gap building, uh, one of the more recent buildings, 2009-2011 by 8 Inc. Um, and then the final uh, building on this strip um, was one which had literally just been completed earlier that year, so completed in 2017, which uh, it was it Ginza Place by uh, Klein Dyson Architecture, um, where we enjoyed, it was over lunchtime if I remember, um, doing this sort of virtual reality driving cars and um, so it had every sort of gizmo um, uh, uh, going internally um, and this sort of wonderful lovely uh, sort of escalator wall. Um, so over to you, um, uh, back to you uh, Neil, I think for uh, uh, a bit more Kenzo Tangi. 
Yes, this is right at the end of Ginza. Ginza was an area that got redeveloped after a huge fire in the um, 1870s. And actually it was laid out by um, an Irish, Irish architect called Thomas Waters, or engineer I should say, not architect. And it was laid out on a grid, a grid of which didn't actually do very well in the humid climate of Japan. But the grid, the street grid still remains and at the far end the West End, there is this building by Tangi, which is the uh, Shitsuoko Press and Broadcasting Tower. And I think here we again get a, um, a foretaste in 1967, a foretaste of the, the uh, metabolist um, architecture. The metabolist um, manifesto had been launched in 1960, and it was launched by young men who were all in Kenzo Tangi's studio at the University of Tokyo. So in 1967, there's Tangi in a way leading the way, but what um, is I think regarded as probably the most famous uh, metabolist building is Kisho Kurokawa's uh, Nakajin capsule tower. And you can see it, it's here. I think that, um, I should explain the reason that John took over just then was that I was in charge of getting people through this building. And as far as I remember, there were four groups I had to take through the building, which meant I missed out on all the Ginza walk. Um, but anyway, I got an awful lot of the capsule tower, which was nice. There are 140 of these capsules. And the steel box is 2.3 by 3.8 by 2.1 meters. And the idea is that they're to be replaced every 25 to 35 years. Oh, there are all the letter boxes, which you saw um, Tom Croft photographing. If those boxes had been replaced every 25 years, we'd be coming to the end of the second um, round of um, the second series of boxes. But of course, these are the first boxes and they've been there for nearly 50 years. And they're looking, well, on the outside, looking really quite shabby. And there is a lot of netting put over the building to catch any pieces of metal or cladding that happens to fall off. So it doesn't help, it doesn't hurt people passing by. These are very much in the manner of the, um, the Japanese minimal space. Everything you want is there, television, tape player, radio, telephone. You can upgrade this, of course, um, in terms of Wi-Fi and things like that that you want nowadays. There'd be a simple bed, a futon probably, a little bathroom in the corner and so on. And all the capsule towers are arranged, sorry, all the capsules are arranged around two towers with the staircase going around the central court where there are elevators. So there's two shafts, two sets of elevators and two staircases and then the, the capsules wrapped around the outside. The building does need some um, care and attention and uh, one hopes that this will happen. So what is this? Are we in Tokyo or are we in India? We are at the uh, Juji Honganji Temple in Tokyo 1931 to 34, built by Chuto Ito. Ito was a very interesting person. He was quite um, divisive. He was an educator. He rejected Western influence and he argued Japan really um, related to China by, sorry, related to India by way of China, by the Silk Route in a sense. And he saw that the architecture of Japan should really relate back to architecture in India. So we get a number of Indian buildings or buildings with Indian influences being built by this, this architect. And this is a Buddhist temple. Something completely different. Raphael Vignoli, the Tokyo International Forum. A building that takes an awkward slice of land and produces a, a strange shape as a result. It's um, best known for this, this huge and really rather magnificent space on the inside. I could possibly say, but it's quite interesting to go across those bridges, unless, of course, you use from vertigo. Architecture as showmanship. <laughs> yes, and um, rather better than the work he's done in the UK, I think uh, the walkie talkie, 
Um, at night, we were, um, how could it, spirited away or, or enticed to go and see the commercial or the retail district of Omotisando um, by one of our participants, Tom Croft. Um, so uh, Omotisando has most of the high-end um, boutiques, fashion boutiques. Um, we start off with the V28 building by Creative Designers International of 2002 to 2004. This rather amazing uh, entrance to the Tokyo Plaza, Otomasando Sando Tokyo Plaza by Hiroshi uh, Nakamura of 2011 to 2012. Um, lots of English uh, labels, so this is the Burberry Building um, by Christopher Bailey from 2013 to 2014. And as you can see, these buildings are meant to be seen at night. Now you might think this is Frank Gehry, in fact it's not, it's by Nokiro no, Nohiko Dan and Associates, um, uh, the Hugo Boss building from 2011 to 2013. So we have wacky buildings, we have uh, even, I'm just thinking about not wacky designers, but the wonderful Vivian Westwood uh, and here's the, her shop um, with fantastic um, uh, neon sign. We have Woolrich um, with a sort of uh, uh, an elevation in a sort of form of tartan. Um, then we have what I might call buildings, you know, holy buildings almost. So <laughs> this is uh, um, uh, the Todd's uh, store um, by um, Toyo Ito and Associates. Slightly uh, the same sort of concept or idea, but uh, uh, slightly different. This is um, Prada, and this is Herzog and de Muren, the first of two buildings which we'll see by them. Um, so this it was done in 2003 to 2004. This is the entrance, and then you see the building itself. Um, you know, all these buildings are really designed to be seen at night, um, and they really come into their own at night. And this is a later or building or the latest building along this strip, which is a Mew uh, Mew, Mew uh, Ayama store um, from 2014 to 2015, next to Stella McCartney um, Boutique. And then we have Cool, um, and this is um, Future Systems, a uh, Comme de Garçon store from 1999, so one of the first ones, a beautiful um, piece of design. They are future uh, systems, Jan Kapliki and uh, uh, Amanda Lebet. And then remaining with Cool, we have um, Sanar's um, uh, uh, Christian Dior store um, from 2002-2003 as well. So that was a fabulous night in some of the highest and probably most expensive uh, uh, how can it, fashion uh, uh, strips uh, you'll ever find in the world. Um, and then the next day, back to you, Neil. Well, thank you, yes. Back to earth with a thump. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright, or as the Japanese would say, Flanko Lloyd Olaito. And working with his Japanese assistant, Arato Endo, this is the GU Gokaken, sorry, GU uh, Gakuen, um, which was a school. It was really, the name of the school is the School of the Free Spirit. And it was designed for uh, friends of Arata Endo, uh, Yoshikazu and his wife Motoko Hani. And they were journalists, uh, social reformers and educators. So this is in every way a, a progressive building by a progressive architect. And if you've seen Frank Lloyd Wright's work in, uh, in Chicago, in Oak Park, I think this building could fit in there quite comfortably. It's not like a minute, and it's much more in, in the manner of his, his prairie style architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright furniture, always uncomfortable. Frank <laughs> Lloyd Wright lighting, um, which doesn't like very much. And uh, then we went on. We didn't have much time because we had to catch the, the train, the Shinkansen down to Nagoya. But we went on to the um, Olympic Park area in uh, Yoyogi, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Yoyogi National Stadium and Gymnasium. 
these two buildings by Kenzo Tange for the 1964 Olympics. I don't know how many people know, but the, the Jap Japan was to hold the Olympics in 1940, and that got cancelled for sort of obvious reasons. They are doing it in, they did it in 1964, and um, I think there's a very good chance if it hasn't already happened that the 19, sorry, the 2020 Olympics will be cancelled as well. It probably has, but I've missed that bit of news. So they seem almost forever blighted. The stadia are, are wonderful buildings with um, uh, cable roof structures. The larger one takes 13,246 people for a swimming event. This is the bigger one, but the seats are movable so you can cover up the pool and you can get 16,264 in there for a arena event. And the smaller building uh, used for boxing, for instance, 5,351. So these, I think, are, are absolutely magnificent buildings and they're, they're in many ways um, a long way ahead of their time. And you might think they're expressions of um, modern international style architecture, but I would argue actually that they're still quite, quite Japanese in their form and in some of the, the sort of hidden subtle iconography that appears particularly around the, um, the roof line of the building. Right, so we left Tokyo, we took the Shinkansen, as I say, to Nagoya, and we got on a bus there and went, a coach, went to uh, the Meiji Mura, the architectural village out by a lake. The first building we went to see, because everyone was desperate to see it and also get some refreshments, was right at the far end. So rather nicely, we walked right the way through the park and then came back. This is the Imperial Hotel, or to be more honest, it's a bit of the Imperial Hotel by Frank Lloyd Wright. It is the sort of central entrance area that was probably three times as much behind, which never survived, and there were wings coming out to the front, which aren't there either. But anyway, quite a bit of it was rebuilt here, and it's an extraordinary and absolutely fascinating building. It's done in yellow brick, in the manner of, shall we say, the Roby house, these thin Roman bricks with raked joints, raked horizontal joints. And the stonework that you can see there is Oya stone. It's a Japanese lava stone, which is quite easy to, to carve. This is the main entrance hall, um, a well-positioned photograph because there's a very large portrait of Frank Lloyd Wright on one of the galleries there, but John has managed to exclude that. So you oh, yeah. can see the tape, Oh, does it appear up? Oh, there it is. Yes, the man himself. Um, in the previous picture, there are tables in the top left-hand corner, and that was where we were having our tea. You can see that across there. And you can, you can have Frank Lloyd Wright um, crockery and Frank Lloyd Wright furniture, and you can even go away with um, a tea set, which you can buy at the shop, designed by the great man himself. And I think anyone who, who wants to sort of indulge in a Frank Lloyd Wright fantasy um, enjoy a world that has departed. This is a wonderful place to go to. And in the bright light, and this was really quite a hot day, it is uh, very enjoyable. The cabinet library of the Tokyo Imperial Palace. Well, you might think Japanese buildings can be moved easily, but look at this, a shifting out a big stone building all the way from Tokyo, quite an undertaking. And then the head office of the cabinet, Next picture, 1927, not so much of that. <laughs> but you can see the influence of Western architecture here on Japan. This, of course, is somewhat more traditional Japanese, uh, St. Paul's Church from Nagasaki, <coughs> excuse me, from Nagasaki, 1879. The influence of Western missionaries, there are a lot of Western missionaries in Japan, uh, particularly after the opening up of the country in 1854. Before that time, they were very much not wanted. Then we have a, uh, the Shin Ohashi Iron Bridge of 1912. The steel here is by the Carnegie Company from the United States. This is the main gate to the Kanazawa prison. Not quite as intimidating as Newgate Jail, but um, it will certainly keep you in. The Central Guard Station and Ward Building from the Kanazawa Prison. 
arranged on a um, Opticum plan, and this is the uh, Mayazu District Courthouse building. These buildings are um, mostly 19th century, as the name the Meiji Mura would suggest. This is the uh, Oguma Photographic Studio. Photography became really very popular in Japan and there were photographic societies set up within the Western concessions where Westerners were allowed to live. And the Japanese, of course, would have themselves photographed with these wonderful backdrops. And this is um, really a rather nice, nice um, recreation of that type of space. St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church from Kyoto, shifted all the way down here. French influence, without doubt. This is the uh, Kikunoyo Brewery Building of 1868. There's a barrel for your beer. Or would it be sake? I'm not sure. Um, uh, Kurehaza Theatre, also of 1868. Theatre was very popular in Japan. And one would uh, go there for almost the whole day and each family would get a little uh, space, a box. And they'd sit in there and they'd bring their charcoal burners and they'd brew their tea and so on. And you'd walk up and down those raised platforms between the um, between the boxes and then step down into your into your box for the performance. Barber shop um, from Hongo uh, Bunkayoku, Tokyo. They won't be able to do social distancing in that barber shop. Um, what have we got here? The Yuji Yamada post office. I think you can see how enormously influential Western architecture was, that we have post offices, barbers shops, and so many other, in a sense, public service buildings done in the Western style. This is the, the interior of the, the post office building. Now here's an interesting building. This is the Shibakawa Matemon house by Goichi Takeda. And he was a Japanese architect who went and worked in in the West, studied in the West. I think he studied at Birmingham and came back enthused by Western arts and crafts. And I think that is really quite apparent in this building, the use of white stucco, a sort of Voisey Bailey Scott touch, the, um, the veranda on the right and, and so on. The stairs, the interior, all suggest um, a very strong and first-hand Western influence, not something learned from books or indeed taught in the Imperial College of Engineering, now that the University of Tokyo. This is the reception hall for the Marquis of uh, Sugumichi's, Sugumichi Saigo's house, 1877. And then finally, James MacDonald Gardiner built this St. John's Church from Kyoto. Uh, Gardiner was an American. He was a a missionary architect. I think that's a wonderful idea. If you want to um, build some buildings, set yourself up as a missionary and get somebody to pay you to build a church. And he built a lot of um, missionary type buildings, including houses indeed. And he worked in Japan then went back to America to train further as an architect and then came over and was doing buildings like this. Okay, so uh, we went back that evening to um, Nagoya and in the morning in somewhat drizzly weather went out to see a building which has recently just been restored. Uh, Fumihiko Maki's Toyoda Memorial Hall at Nagoya University 1959 which was the first building in Japan that uh, Maki built when he came back from living and teaching in the United States and I think it's an extraordinary building for for that date. Very crisp, very sharp and um, well you could see it even today and think it was very modern. It's 60 years old. We got on the bus again and now we went off to another building that was a complete um, 
eye opener or jaw dropper. Kenzo Tangi, the Sumi Memorial Hall at Ichinomiya. This looks like a fortress and well it isn't really. You see the big gates there, once they're pulled back you go in and there's a huge internal courtyard and garden and the building although set behind these walls opens out onto that garden. The influences are, are clearly Corbusier and you could see that in the water spout there and in the little windows and the, um, the building I think is enormously forceful. It's 1957 and what was it built for? It was built for the uh, Tsuyakin uh, Kogio Company. The Tsuyakin Kogio Company were in textiles and it was meant to be a meeting place for textile um, manufacturing all over Japan. And it really is, 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 I think, a fabulous building. And all the more so because you get such a little, so you get so small an impression of what it's like on the inside from behind those great battered walls on the outside. We moved on to another um, post-war building. This is Junso Sakakura. He was the, the second Japanese architect to go and work for Le Corbusier and stayed in his office quite the longest and became almost the, the most senior person in the office uh, below Le Corbusier and Pierre Jeanneret. And he had the authority to sign off the drawings. He came back to um, Japan and built, after the war, built this um, town hall at Hashima, or the city hall at Hashima, which was where his uh, family came from. They were uh, rice farmers and they, well, rice, um, yes, I guess rice farmers is probably the right word. And they, they had um, quite a lot of wealth in this land around here. A building which, once again, I think shows the influence of Le Corbusier, but also has a very Japanese touch to it. This was added on the back um, some years later, I, I could never work out if this was by Sakakura or by another architect, but it's a, it's a curious and, and rather intimidating addition to the rear of that very expressive building at the front. And then we went on to this extraordinary um, social housing development, um, the high town apartments at Kitigata, um, which were built in the late 90s, 1998 and 1999. Um, the architect uh, Arata Izo, Izozaki um, commissioned uh, four female architects, four women architects, each to do a block. Uh, two Japanese uh, women architects and two, um, well, one from uh, Europe and one from America. Um, and this is the first one. So this is um, uh, by um, Akiko Takahashi. Um, and each have a similar sort of uh, layout, but uh, quite different uh, form. Um, so this, I say, is by Kiko Takahashi. And then we have um, this one by Dilla Scofid Scofidio and Renfro. And this one is by, was the uh, UK uh, contribution. This is uh, Christine uh, Hawley or Professor Christine Hawley, now professor, one of the professors of architecture at the Bartlett. Um, uh, uh, hasn't done much, a huge amount of work. She worked with Peter Cook in the um, uh, 60s and 70s. Um, but this is probably her biggest scheme or biggest scheme which she, she did. And then finally amongst the four, and probably I think the best of the lot, is by Kazuyo uh, Sejima of Sanar, um, and it's just stunningly beautiful. In fact, in a strange sort of way, the very cloudy day, um, very dull day, actually um, uh, heightened, um, dare I say it, my enjoyment of, of this block with these amazing um, uh, external stairs, <laughs> uh, <laughs> quite uh, thrilling in a way as you can see. And um, 
really interesting because you, within them is a really unique sort of uh, dual level uh, apartment blocks, um, which you don't see from this side, um, but you can see from here. So you have double height rooms, really interesting and unique sort of spatial orientation of the blocks uh, of the individual apartments. On back to you, Neil. Thank you. And then the next day we got back of the coach and went to Nishinomiya. And the reason for going there was to see this hotel. This is by um, Arata Endo, Frank Lloyd Wright's assistant on the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. And this is referred to as the Imperial Hotel of the West. And I think in this one can see very clearly the influence of Wright. And of course, the whole building is here compared to the um, remains of the Imperial Hotel, which at least some of it has remained. And this is the building that is now a school of architecture for young women. And I hope they're training them in the right way of thinking, because you could hardly go wrong in a building like this. It is full of interest, it's full of detail, full of richness. The tiles, such as you see here, the, um, the cut panels of stonework, and then the interior, the main ballroom, with its ceiling almost dripping with, with richness. A building that in many ways looks its, its date. This is the 1930s. This is what one would expect a building to look like. But it is um, quite extraordinary. You can see in this entrance as well as the, um, you know, the influence of Wright coming through. And then we ended up um, back in Kyoto and we went to the, I lost it, where did we go to? The International uh, Conference Center on the north end of, of Kyoto by Asacho Atani. This was built in 1964, it was one in competition. And this is as close as one might come to a megastructure at that time. And I think it is um, undeniably a Japanese building. I said in relation to the, um, the, the Olympic Stadia in uh, Yoyogi, how those modern buildings were nevertheless Japanese. This one is almost even more so. And the way that it is structured, the, the cross section, those great shoulders that stick out almost look like um, the armor worn by um, you know, Japanese soldiers in the Edo period. It's a building of a number of parts and I think we just get a, a sample of it there. In the center of Tokyo there is this station. It looks relatively, relatively unprepossessing here. Kyoto Station Complex by uh, Hiroshi Hara. Yes, but go inside it and it is again a, one of these breathtaking spaces. This is built between 1991 and 97. And you can see the escalators going up there at the far end. You can get to those escalators and go up something like 14 stories and you end up on levels of restaurants and uh, terraces looking out over the city and looking back down towards the, the heart of the station concourse, which we see here. Back to traditional Japan in a way, at Nara. This, um, sorry, not Nara, at Uji. This is the Phoenix Hall, the Biodo Inn Temple. And the significance of this is that this was the basis of the, the building which became the 1993 World's Columbian Fair in Chicago. And this is the first that was the first Japanese building that Frank Lloyd Wright saw and it hugely impressed him and influenced his architecture enormously, not just in his, his appreciation of Japanese form, but particularly in the plan of the building, which is um, in a strange way rather Beaux Arts as well, a central pavilion side wings with end pavilions. And then on to, um, sorry, have we gone on John? Yes. Yep, no, no. Then, then 
on to uh, Nara, the ancient capital of Japan. Hundreds of tourists and lots of uh, deer wandering around waiting to be fed. You can buy little packets of um, nuts to give to the deer, but the instructions are in Japanese and they probably say not for human consumption, but many people you see, particularly Westerners, sit in there munching on nuts and the deer are wondering what has happened to their food. Can I, can I actually butt in at this moment? I'm very sorry to interrupt, but yes. um, I think we're going to, we're, we've, we've got a, a long way to go, haven't we? Um, um, and um, I read quite a few calls for maybe we should split this and do a part two. How, how, what percentage of the way through do you think you are with your slides, John? Um, I think we're about uh, two thirds, three quarters. Good that. But we're very happy to um, uh, have another go. Um, I think I think I think that would probably be better, not least because I'm I'm aware that it's the very last day of clapping, and that some people may want to go and do that um, at eight o'clock. Um, and we have got um, we have got at least one question, which I think um, it would be good to put to you. Um, um, hang on, where am I with my questions? Um, I'm, oh, I know where I am. The, we had a question that I, um, I have temporarily lost, but it was a really good one about whether, um, whether you've both thought that. The, I, 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 I can find the question. Okay. If you want it. It's uh, from Ursula who says, would you agree that the influence of traditional Japanese interiors on early Western mo modernism is much underestimated? There you go. Um, well, probably over to you, Neil, to start with. Um, I, I think the answer would be yes. Is the influence of Jap traditional Japanese what? Uh, traditional Japanese, would you agree that the influence of traditional Japanese interiors on early Western modernism is much underestimated. And I suspect a yes or no answer isn't quite what's um, no. anticipated. Early Western modernism. Um, well, the, the influence of Japanese interiors on late 19th century was, is, is widely recognized, the Japanese craze was was very significant in this country and in in the United States. The um, early modernism, if that is say from the end of the First World War, then possibly less so. Um, it sh certainly should be should be recognized and I think buildings like um, the Farnsworth House for instance are, are totally Japanese except it has a flat roof whereas Japanese buildings had pitched roofs. I think the influence on those western interiors um, in the in the um, years of the modern movement were um, you know, were certainly there and maybe more could be made of that. Yeah I'm thinking um, certainly the early modernists in America I also think uh, not Neutra but um, uh, over in LA um, who, who did the Lovell House and was that Neutra? That was Neutra. Neutra. Uh, and who did he stay with? Neutra. So that wonderful house from about the, the green and green gamble house, I think. Is yeah, called. yeah. Um, but yes. also, Wells Coates spent a lot of time in Japan, didn't he? And I think he was influenced. Uh, well, he was born. He was born in Japan. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Wells Coates was the architect who designed the Isacon building, the Lawn Road flats that's now open in part as a as a, a gallery space. Yeah. Um, Actually, Actually no, a, another interesting question. Kurt has come up which says outside of national monuments religious buildings etc to what extent are 20th century buildings being protected in Japan and what was your sense of how far the Japanese recognize and value their 20th century buildings particularly post-war? I think the Japanese don't recognize it adequately and I don't think they're necessarily protected very well. The Nakajin capsule tower for instance is a good example of that. Um, there was a, <clears throat> a really interesting building by Kiyonori Kikutake, uh, which was a concrete building in a, a Buddhist um, um, compound, which got demolished quite recently despite many protestations. And 
I think it was the 20th century society building of the of the week at one point. But it, um, you know, it's something that, unlike this country, is, is I think a big problem that these buildings do um, do suffer and do get swept away. But having said that, it is in the Japanese um, culture, the way of thinking that buildings are temporary. And that's what the metabolist movement was about. And for centuries, Japanese buildings have been swept away due to earthquakes, floods and fire. And they're not worried about it. They just start again. We have a, a different attitude to that. We have buildings dating back to you know, the Norman conquest, which is still very much there. To find something that old in Japan is difficult, except for the building you're looking at now. The metabolist buildings, of course, were designed to be um, addable to expandable and alterable meal. Absolutely, uh, yes. I mean, are there good examples of any of those where that has happened and, and been successful? So, I mean, it's always, it's always in the UK a, a problematic thing for us, I think, when the building's designed to be flexible. Um, it, it's always caused enormous debate um, if alterations are proposed to it, whether they're in the spirit of the, the original flexible idea or whether we're, um, you know, or, or, you know yes, whether well, the flexibility should be allowed to actually occur is, is always a debate. Well, I think a very good example of what you're asking is Fumihiko Maki's hillside terrace complex in Tokyo, yeah. you know, which has continued to grow and change. And in a way, there's, there might be a master plan, but it, it's, it, it is nothing that is, is firmly fixed and things change and, and yeah. develop. Yes, that looks like that looked like a very good example, actually. You're the right. Sky House uh, by Kiyonari Kikutaki, which we didn't see. The Sky House, um, which was built in 1958-59, was a concrete box on four legs. And that changed and that developed as his family grew. Uh, the box was raised up and he hung new living spaces underneath for the children when they arrived. And he was one of the metabolists, that's a, a building that has um, demonstrate the metabolist theory perfectly. Excellent. Just say, we're also getting comments here that um, people would very much like a, a part two. Yes, this, so I think we should um, um, draw it to a close now. So I'd just like to thank both John, obviously, and Neil. Thank you both very much indeed. Um, I would um, also like to thank everyone who's um, logged on tonight, and particularly our um, members amongst you um, and a big hello to everyone who actually came to Japan. Um, if you would like to support 20th Century please do consider making a donation. Um, there is the the offer of those uh, greetings cards with John's pictures on to um, try and um, encourage you to do so but um, but really I mean I would just urge you if, if at all possible to um, check out our website see what we're about um, consider becoming a member and um, and um, and we will post very shortly when we're going to finish off this massive tour um, and we've already seen the most extraordinary range of buildings both in terms of style and scale um, and um, and we obviously still have a ways to go um, next week we are uh, doing um, luchins in India and you can book for that via our website and um and we are planning to add um an ongoing program on thursday nights while everyone's still under lockdown so um so yes thank you again thanks very much indeed and goodbye everybody <laughs>